Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The topic is peace through Islamic Christian dialogue. Yeah, there are two crucial words, peace and dialogue. And uh, the question is, what is the connection between the two words? Does the dialogue, especially the interreligious dialogue, and in particular, the dialogue between Christians and Muslims, lead to peace? Or is peace the indispensable condition to have a truthful, conceivable, and effective dialogue? This is a question. Usually, philosophers would start their research with something called definition of terms, explanatio terminorum. For this reason, I would like to introduce the definition of the word peace and the definition of the word dialogue. Peace. I do not think that today there is a word that is repeated more frequently by human beings like the word peace due to existing world crises and wars. There is first a very simple definition of peace, second and a more comprehensive one, and third a full definition of peace. The simple definition of, states that peace is the absence of war. This definition is incomplete. For absence of war does not actually mean peace. For cold war is more devastating and consuming than effective war. A more comprehensive definition is that peace means the prevalence of justice, namely to give every person his rights. Uniquique sum, we see in Latin. This definition, definition is very true, as there, there could be no peace without the prevalence of equal rights and justice first, without returning what these persons as individuals and these communities as countries have been robbed and deprived of. This definition is also lacking. And I think that the full definition of peace is no peace without justice and no peace without reconciliation and forgiveness. I mention this because there are peace treaties among individuals and among countries but they, they remain as they are, cold peace treaties, signed between heads of states in order to stop the war. But peoples of these countries have not reconciled, nor forgiven, nor are willing to accept each other. The peace treaties between Israel and Egypt and between Israel and Jordan, for example, politically seem correct and applied on the ground. But the Egyptian people and the people of Jordan did not reconcile with the Israeli people. Here we find the first connection between peace and interreligious dialogue. For to reconcile, to forget the past, and to admit one's fault are true religious principles and ethics. Thus the comparison between peace and reconciliation that happened between European countries, namely between France and Germany after World War II, come to mind. For those countries who had signed the peace treaties worked at the same time on reconciling the people, in particular the young who hold the future in their hands, a reconciliation that led to the start of the European Union. There is finally no peace without justice, no true peace without reconciliation and forgiveness. Then I come to the term dialogue. 
the dialogue in particular, interreligious dialogue, and specifically between Christians and Muslims, is a word frequently used in today's society. The dialogue differs whether it is political, economical, social, or religious. Our topic today is the religious dialogue. Pope Francis wrote a small chapter in his last encyclical, Evangelii Gaudium, on the dialogue, of which I would like to mention his most important sayings. One, to respect the other is important in the dialogue. It is not a dispute in an, in an attempt to convince the other. It is necessary to know that the other has something more than I have. The dialogue holds a certain dilemma that says that we should get out of our inner self and our convictions by possessing the absolute truth to accept the other and by admitting that we need the other's truth. We should accept this struggle and embrace it, not from a political or strategical perspective of view, but for the seeking of the truth. Second, dialogue means that we know that the other has something good, not only something different. He has something good to tell us. I mean to pave the way within to accept the good things. Nevertheless, dialogue does not mean giving up on personal ideas or faith or traditions, but it means to give up on the idea that our thoughts and our traditions are soul and absolute. Third, and when there is a problem in the dialogue, and after the storm had passed, we must speed up an immediate dialogue. Do not mind the flying saucers from time to time, says the Pope, as it is important to initiate the dialogue as soon as possible. Time builds barriers and allows the wheat to grow and impedes the growth of the wet. So when the barriers grow, the, the dialogue becomes difficult and the reconciliation more difficult. Barriers between human humans promote hatred and grudges. Fourth, in dialogue, as in all things, Haste is from the devil. This is St. Jerome who says this. We need patience if we want to understand who is different from us and who might enrich us with the good that's with, within him. Man expresses himself freely and honestly, not when he, is, when he feels tolerated, but rather when he encounters acceptance and love. The issue is not to wish others to become like me, but rather that I become like them. Not to allow others to enter my word, but rather that I enter their word. And now we come to talk about the dialogue between Christians and Muslims. To speak about the Muslim-Christian dialogue I personally experience, particularly in Jordan and in the Middle East in general, a dialogue between Christians and Muslim believers who belong to the same people, eth ethnicity, language, culture and traditions, social and even psychological reactions. First, the dialogue of life, the dialogue of coexistence. Coexistence in the school, university, work, and social relations. This dialogue is generally lived and exists, of course, with some shortcomings. This is normal in the human world. However, however, this coexistence stops when there are mixed religious marriages. This is due to a sense of religious sensitivity 
sensitivity uh, for Christians and Muslims alike, due, due to the social customs and traditions, and sometimes due to convictions related to religious beliefs. Second, then there is the formal and academic dialogue. In dialogue of, of intellectuals, officials, institutes, and conferences. It is also a dialogue that is frequently used. It focuses mostly on the exchange of ideas on general topics of interest to the Christian and Muslim equally, and Muslim equally. Justice, freedom, peace, child's right, women's right, upper bringing of the new generation and the acceptance of others. The formal and academic dialogue rarely touches subjects related to the Christian and Muslim beliefs, as the religious issues are highly sensitive on both sides. <clears throat> there is also the spiritual dialogue. This may be the most beautiful forms of dialogue because it touches the absolute spiritual relationship between the Christian Muslim faithful and his God. I can say that the latter is the most beautiful of all because it is free from the historical residues and free from the religious sensitivities and social customs. As whenever the human being rises, the barriers and walls fall down. The question now is, how can peace be achieved through Islamic Christian dialogue? We said that real peace includes ethical values, such as reconciliation, admittance of sin, and acceptance of forgiveness. There is no doubt that there are secular and moral values independent from religion, but fundamental moral values are of clear religious origin. It is true that separation, re, separating religion from politics is important, but this separation does not mean the lack of cooperation for the, for the common good. In particular, the cooperation between the two most widespread religions in the world, Christianity and Islam, to spread peace between individuals communities, and countries. One of the things that the religious dialogue aims to resolve is what Pope John Paul II mentioned in his letter, Solicitud de Reyes Socialis, Social Concern, in 1987, on the structural sin and its impediment and on promoting peace. It is the responsibility of one person as such but political groups and multinational societies as well. Of these sins, structural sins, colonialism, slavery, exploitation of children, and plundering of wealth of the poor countries. Religious debaters state that what God had created is for all human beings and that the common good is more important than personal gain. Sharing and solidarity is more important than selfishness. Person is more important than production. If matters reversed, then the world will, will continue contrary to what God, the creator, had planned for the humankind. And as a result, real peace will not be spread among individuals on one hand and among communities and countries on the other. Another matter of the Islamic Christian dialogue focuses on is the human dignity and placing it above any other consideration. In, in Christianity, God created man in his own image and likeness and gave him dominion over the earth and all within it. And in Islam, 
Man is the vice regent of God on earth. Wakilullah al In both religions, man's dignity is derived from God, the Creator. And denying him his right is a violation in itself against God's dignity and God's image. What prevents true peace is the fact that reality works against what religious dialogue calls for. The reality is that there is the poor and the rich. There is the powerful and the meek. There is the ruler and the ruled. The reality is that there is a division created by man between the good and the evil, between decision makers and executors. The reality is that there is a first, a second, a third and a tenth world. The situation in the Middle East during the past three years is a witness to what I have mentioned. The interreligious dialogue contributes to the prevalence of peace through its continued call to respect the human dignity and to consider it a top priority. Starting with the fundamental equality among all human beings, religious dialogue also contributes to the prevalence of peace through his calling for a life of harmony among all nations and origins of today's society. Since today's society is multiple in religion, culture, language, and history, and peace cannot prevail, unless all communities' components are given the right to contribute to the life of the community and its development so that it may feel that it is a fundamental element and not just a marginalized intruder. In this way, we can solve the problem of refugees, migrants, and immigrants who go to live in countries other than their own for the purpose of work. In this way, we can overcome the mentality of the frightened minority and those seeking protection from outside. In this way, we can overcome the mentality of the majority who allow themselves to step over the rights of the minority. Only then, it can be for all components of the community to live a life of peace and harmony. Conclusion. It may be argued that religions should work on the prevalence of peace among its faithful before giving advice to achieve peace among other nations and communities. This is true. As the theological differences between religions and the divisions within religion itself reduces the influential degree of the religious ethics. However, we should not exaggerate the, in this matter, and we should not give it more than it's worth. The ethical values, which we have spoken of, and the general spiritual values are common among all religions, especially peace which is the subject of this conference. There is no Christian peace, or Muslim peace, or Jewish peace, or Buddhist peace. All religious call, all religions call for peace between man and his creator, and between man and himself. Peace between man and his brother is only a reflection of internal peace that brings together the creation with its creator and is a sign of internal harmony, which is a sign of inner peace for the man himself. And thank you very much. Well, thanks to His Excellency Manuel Laham for this dance. A reflection, I think, uh, uh, this, this string, strong link between uh, uh, religious dialogue and uh, 
the action to enforce, not only to extend peace, but to enforce the very notion of peace will be uh, important for, for future discussion. But now I, I, I just want to invite and, and, and leave the floor to the second speaker of this session. Ah, uh, we have 10 minutes. You don't have to leave. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. So, the, so we, we can collect some quick points and then maybe after packaging the points, uh, we uh, leave the floor again to, please, Sorry. your name and, and, and the question. Hello, my name is Tarina Cardwell. I'm a PhD student at the ICD. And um, you mentioned different types of interfaith dialogue. You mentioned sort of the official and academic interfaith dialogue. And then you mentioned the more um, spiritual interfaith dialogue. And I was just wondering, um, how do you think we can encourage people who are maybe perhaps having a more academic interfaith dialogue to really engage in real spiritual interfaith dialogue with one another? Yes. More, more questions? Please. As I know well, in your country, the, the peaceful is, uh, exists. Yes, it's strange, uh, uh, perhaps near the, <laughs> the place of war, um, if I know well. And what is the mainly reason of it? Uh, uh, because of the personality of king or the, the mentality of the nation? Uh, or the other reason uh, can uh, we thanks the situation. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Thank you for the questions. I go to the first one. Certainly there is the academic dialogue and there is the spiritual dialogue. Now I really prefer the spiritual one. Now, how to lead the academic, the academicians to uh, raise up to the spiritual uh, is not an easy job. You know why? Academic uh, dialogue is an official one. Uh, we call it uh, the dialogue of charity. So compliments, we are good, we are good people, you know, we love each other, etc. There is no substantial differences, etc., etc., etc. But when you come to the dialogue of truth, when we say really what makes you suffer and what makes you uh, misunderstood by others, then the dialogue stops. Because it's, it's aimed uh, just to, uh, to give a show, an academic show that in intellectuals gather to meet and they shake hands and they take a coffee and a good dinner and then they separate. Rarely an academic uh, dialogue uh, led to anything uh, concrete and substantial. Also because academic dialogue never, never meets the dogmatic points. And it's, it's not normal that in a, in a dialogue a Christian uh, discusses about the Trinity or, or the Eucharist. It's impossible to do. But when, when we go to the spiritual dialogue, then all these human barriers fall because the spiritual one is, is a re reflection of your own relation with God. And when we speak on, of, of our own relation with God, uh, many, many, many things who separate believers fall down. And, and we see that uh, the higher we go, uh, the less wall, walls are there. But now, to lead the politicians or the academics to a spiritual then, we need a, a very big dose of uh, spirituality and conversion. We'll, we'll pray for that. Pray for that. Thank you. Monsignor, yes. Uh, I, uh, I live in Jordan, and Jordan, by, by, by a miracle, by the grace of God, by the providence, by the wisdom of our king and our government, uh, is still in a oasis of peace and uh, security, uh, although we are... Uh, you know, among all kind of countries, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Israel, uh, where there are crises and fights. Is, is it due to what? To many things. First of God, first the, the grace of God, I, I imagine. Second, the, the wisdom of the king, you know. Uh, 
when the Arab Spring uh, started, we had also in Jordan some manifestations in the streets by the Islamic Brotherhood. But then the king uh, dealt with this with a with very high sense of uh, prudence. Uh, he sent police, but without arms. And he told them, when they finish the demonstration, you give them, you give them bottles of water to, to calm down. And uh, afterward, with the failure of the political Islam in Tunisia, namely, and in Egypt, uh, the Islamic movements in uh, Jordan adopted a low profile. Now that, that does not mean that we, are, we will be always protected against this virus of violence, but we hope and pray that, especially the Syrian crisis comes to, to an end, to a peaceful end, and then Jordan also will enjoy more peace. Yep, one, just one more. Good morning. I'm Ruth Brody Sharon. I'm the co chair for the Southern California Parliament of the World's Religions in Los Angeles. And I'm also representing the Interfaith Observer, which is an online magazine which everyone is free to subscribe to, no cost. And uh, it tells interfaith stories around the world. I wanted to point something out, which I'm sure you know, but which has been meaningful to us is that the King of Jordan established a UN initiative called the World Interfaith Harmony Week in February every year. We've been participating in that for the last two years. And um, they basically have offered prizes to communities around the world who are engaged in interfaith activity to submit uh, documentation for the, the activities that they, that they put on during that week, the first week in February. And they've given out prizes to uh, many communities uh, in, in, um, not in the West, as I assume that those communities really need the money even more than the Western communities do. But I, my question to you is, first of all, this is a wonderful initiative and we're excited about it. Uh, how has that initiative impacted Jordan itself and the interfaith work that's going on in Jordan? Yes, thank you. First of, <coughs> first of all, Jordan has never been a, a focus of Islamic uh, fund, fundamentalism, really. Uh, Jordan Islam is uh, Sunnite, and it's all Sunnis, all, all uh, Muslim Jordanians who are 97% of the population, as Christians are 3%, but they are very moderate. It is true that the Week of Harmony uh, was established by the king, and every year there are TV encounters, etc. And yesterday, yesterday, I received a call from my secretary in, in Amman. They are asking for three persons of each church to give rewards for the week of harm, for this last week of harmony in February. Not only this, uh, you must remember that in, uh, last September, uh, King Abdullah called for a colloquium in Jordan for all Christian leaders in the Arab world. So he called for more than 70 patriarchs and bishops and the theme was the challenges of the Arab Christians in the Arab world. So he asked every church leader from all over the Arab world to come, to come and present a paper on what are the difficulties and the challenges they are facing in their countries, uh, including Jordan. I presented the paper on Jordan in order to see how can we solve these challenges. So I think this, this mentality of tolerance, of openness, of acceptance of the other uh, is very important. One last detail. Uh, we had a meeting with the uh, Royal Protocol and the Vatican Protocol to prepare the visit of uh, Pope Francis to Jordan in May. So it was in the presence, presence of the king. So the king told his protocol and told us, whatever Pope Francis wants, you just give him. He is our host, he is our guest, and Whenever he, he wants to come, wherever he wants to go, I have no preconditions to his visit. I have one condition. I would ask Pope Francis to celebrate a mass for my Jordanian Christians. Was it not good? So this is our king. God save him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.